Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so in this talk, I would like to show how cognitive archaeology could help us to understand the evolution of our geometric cognition. And <clears throat> in order to show that, I will first give a brief introduction about the philosophy of mathematical practice make assumptions that are related with my case study. Then I will show how cognitive archaeology have usually studied the evolution of our spatial cognition. And in the third part, I will show how this uh, spatial cognition can be later connected with our geometric cognition. And finally, I will draw some conclusions. So the philosophy of mathematical practice is a recent framework in the philosophy of mathematics studies proposing three characteristics of mathematics that are the cognitive, the historical, and the pragmatic aspects. The cognitive aspects in my work concern to the cognitive basis of mathematics and specifically about the cognitive rules of geometric knowledge. The historical aspect is doing reference to the fact that mathematics is something that evolved in time, that changed. And the pragmatic approach is doing reference to uh, mathematics is what the mathematicians do in doing mathematics. So these three aspects lead me to search or to look for the archaeology of geometry, understanding mathematics as something that has evolved in time since its first manifestation until, until sophisticated mathematical results as Babylonian mathematics or Euclid's elements. And my main interest is in the uh, cognitive roots of uh, this uh, geometric knowledge. That is, what kind of human actions has led to the emergency and development of this body of knowledge. And my main assumption is that these cognitive roots can be found in the material record. And I think that here uh, is important an idea expressed by Malafouris to highlight my purpose, that is that if we want to dig the mind, we have to take into account material record cognitively interpreted. So, uh, in order to understand my purpose, we have to distinguish between a spatial cognition and geometric cognition. A spatial cognition is the human ability to acquire and use information about our environment, and it's really important to navigate it. And it is about the recognition of forms and categorization of objects. So, a spatial cognition is related with human actions in relation to their physical environment. Geometric cognition, instead, is guided by other values and goals, and the emphasis is on the abstract reflection of the spatial relations. So, geometric cognition is related with human activities or human use of external representations at the cognitive level. And there are different sources in the prehistory of human beings to uh, understand and analyze the emergency and evolution of our spatial cognition and its connection with our geometric cognition, as tools manufactured arch astronomy meets rituals, burials, and kefar. But in this talk, I'm going to focus just in the in the first pose. In the first place, uh, talking about uh, the evolution of manufacture of tools, uh, I'm following here Graham Clark's classification of modes of production and we find five across time. In the first place, we have all the one technology with choppers, mode two, the Acheulean industry with the hand axe, mode three, Mousterian industry with the Levalois style, mode four, blade lithic technology, and mode five, microliths, and we can distinguish between compound and composite technologies. So, uh, related with this uh, evolution of tool manufacture, Kulich and Wing, in the pillow of their book Cognitive Models in Paleolithic Archaeology, analyze comparatively all the results presented previously in this uh, book. And they claim that it is with Homo erectus and Handex, that is mode 2, that. Uh, that uh, sorry that a crucial episode in nominee cognitive evolution took place, being the more relevant on record. And in a previous work, these two researchers uh, claim about the hand axe that its manufacture clearly required spatial cognitive abilities. 
the active coordination of dorsal and ventral information from the primary visual cortex, and hierarchical organization of action that also relied on mechanisms of cognitive controls previous was not evident in the stone tools of early hominins. So here, to me, we are talking about the evolution of our spatial cognition, because these spatial abilities are applied by the hominins to practical needs, as for example, to develop better tools in order to hunt in a more efficient way. And the spatial relations that are perceived as symmetry in the Handax case are in relation with the stone's physical properties and the abilities to make them. Now I'm going to talk about our gastronomy and specifically about Gobekli Tepe, that some scholars think that it is the first temple in the humankind history. And our gastronomy is defined as the study of how people understand in the past the different phenomena <coughs> in the sky. So here, the important thing to me is that we can distinguish between two levels of interpretations. In the first level, we have uh, the spatial reasoning underlying this kind of building. For example, they construct this kind of buildings with concentric circles, and we can recognize mainly circles and rectangles in it. So here, <coughs> the, the important thing is the spatial reasoning of this population with their surrounding environment. But in the second level, we have protogeometric reasoning. And this is more interesting to me and is related with the purpose to build this kind of constructions. For example, to alienate them with some protoastronomical uh, sense or to coincide with equinox or solstice. And here is a 2017 study by Sweetman and Sikritsis, uh, entitled uh, The Coding of Eclitepe with Art Astronomy, What Does the Fox Say? And uh, for reasons of time, I'm not going to explain all the details of this work, but the relevant point to me is that they found some pillars, as the pillar 43 in the enclosure D, the Vulture Stone, among other examples, where they found that, on the one hand, that all animal symbols match with their corresponding asterisks. And on the other hand, they found an engraved circle that was representing the sun occupying a particular po position in the zodiacal epoch. And the position, uh, the period that the sun was representing coincide with the younger Dryas event, and specifically with the Taurid meteor that is thought to be the responsible of this event. So the hypothesis of these two researches is that Gobekli Tepe was an observatory to monitor in the night sky following the disaster that happened in this period, as for example, the Younger Dias event and different astronomical events as meteor or comets. This second example is from Andalusia and is the Dolmen of Menga. And here we are not talking about dark astronomy but about myths because this dolmen has an anomalous orientation because it is not following the main astronomical pattern. Rather, this dolmen was willed to directly see the neck of this lady face mountain. I stood here and I could verify that if you stand here, the only thing that you can see is this part of the mountain where the, archeo the archaeologists uh, found a cave with cave art. So the relevant point to me is that the spatial organization to build this dolmen was following a, a, an organization to coincide the dolmen with the mythical figure that is the mountain. And in this last example, I'm going to talk about rituals. These, has, these are the beads from the Lian Su culture in China in the late, late Neolithic. And these objects were used to perform some <coughs> uh, rituals to the heaven and the sun. And the important thing is that this particular circular shape is representing a cosmological concept that is the Gaitian concept of the heaven as a circle. Some analyses have described the motifs inscribed of them, as we can see here, two flying birds and two swimming fishes that are dividing the surface in four equal sections. And the birds and are flying from the east to west as the sun. 
And this coincides with some ancient Chinese legends that claim that there are several suns that are carried out by birds. So, again, the important thing to me is that they are using a particular shape, a circle, to represent their cosmological concepts, the Gaitian concept. So here, to me, we are talking about the emergency of protogeometry, because the spatial abilities here are linked with mythical, uh, ritualistic, or astronomical ideas. And that is, they are, are not intimately linked with practical needs, but with immaterial considerations or ideas. And they use external representations with a specific shape and functionality that connects with some of their immaterial ideas. But we are talking about proto-geometry because we are still far for geometric concepts are a circle in the Euclid's elements. And in this last part of my talk, I would like to show how the evolution of our spatial cognition can be connected with, with our geometric cognition. In the first place, we have this classification uh, proposed by Valeria Giardino, that is a philosopher of mathematical practice. And we have in the first level the extraction of invariance, that is the perceptual capacity to extract a spatial invariance of our environment. In the second level, we have the use of maps or cognitive tools that we use them to represent externally some spatial relations. And in that sense, we are creating a separation from our mere perceptual capacities. And finally, geometric cognition, that is abstract considerations or reflection of spatial relations. And these ideas connect with Rafael Núñez's criticisms to uh, cognitive scientist studies. He said that we have to distinguish between our biologi biologically evolved capacities and our geometric cognition. And cognitive scientists usually do not uh, distinguish between these three levels. So in the first level, we have biologically evolved capacities that are related with our spatial cognition and human perceptual capacities. In the second level, we have enculturation, that is the use of some cognitive tools to represent our environment or other spatial relations. And finally, geometric cognition that is related with the abstract reflection of spatial relations. So the picture from these studies is the next. In the first level, we have extraction of invariance as a biologically evolved capacity, and we use mainly our spatial cognition. In the second level, we have the use of some external representations or enculturation. And I would like to distinguish between two different levels. In the first, we have the use or evolution of tool manufacture. And the important thing to me is that here we are using our spatial cognition, but we are extracting invariants of the objects themselves and not from our environment. In that sense, we can talk about pra pragmatic tools because the important thing is the objects, physical properties, and the actions that we make with them. And in the second level, we have some astronomical, ritual, or mythical ideas. And here, we are talking about the spatial cognition, but the protogeometry is emerging, because we start to use some uh, cognitive tools to re ex uh, represent externally some shapes. And these shapes are important to perform correctly some rituals, or to represent in a good way some astronomical concepts. So, for example, we can distinguish between the symmetry that we have in the handax, where the people do not uh, re don't make reflections about this symmetry, and the symmetry that we can find in the B discs that they were using to a particular purpose, and in this use, the specific shape was really important. And finally, geometric cognition, that is abstract reflection of spatial relations. So two studies that are important to understand my purpose and that support my ideas, as for example, Caroline Overman, that is a cognitive archaeologist, that study a number of populations, and she found that populations with a low level of material complexity do not develop a numerical system to count beyond five. 
Uh, I do not know any study that uh, links the material complexity and geometry, but I think that the uh, results might be comparable to that about numerical cognition. And Napet that talk about uh, social material considerations. For example, in my case study, the spatial organization that used the people from Andalusia that built the Dolmen of Menga was following a particular spatial organization that was related with their environment and that mountain that was a mythical sign to them. But this spatial organization was not used by the people from Gobekli Tepe because they were following another spatial organization. So my conclusions are that uh, to me, as a philosopher of mathematical practice, it's important to point out that to understand the cognitive fruits of our geometry, we have to analyze all the relevant material records that is related with our spatial cognition. And as I show it, there are several sources that are diverse. Second, to acknowledge the difference between spatial cognition and geometric cognition. And the geometric cognition is in relation with the use of some uh, proto-astronomical, ritualistic or mythical, mythical ideas, that is, immaterial ideas. Third, the emergency of proto-geometry is the first step to reach geometric cognition, but we are still uh, far away, because here we are using uh, basic shapes and basic spatial relation. And finally, the future research relation uh, of my work is to carefully analyze the role of the use of external representations in this transition from our spatial cognition to the geometric cognition. Thank you.